Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone who's here today. We have a, a great turnout. Um, we're really excited today to have Dr. Goodman with us um, to talk about her Pulitzer Prize winning work, No Ordinary Time. Um, we're happy to have this in conjunction with Constitution Week. And uh, we're so pleased for um, all the efforts, uh, the schools that collaborated and helped to uh, put this event on. Uh, we're really excited. Um, I'm going to turn a few minutes over to President Holland. Uh, we're happy to have him here with us, and then I'll introduce Dr. Goodwin. Well, I just wanted to take a moment really to talk to Professor Goodwin in public uh, about something. Uh, I want her to know and all of you to hear uh, me say what a, what a proud moment this is for me with, uh, with respect to our students here at Utah Valley University. When I came on board uh, last year, uh, there was some discussion about uh, potential speakers uh, for a big student event for the year. I confess I wasn't overwhelmed with some of the suggestions. And as we began to, excuse me, as we began to talk about this theme, this, what's now become a core theme of the university uh, of uh, striving to be a serious institution. Again, was, UVU is a serious institution of higher learning, and we're set to strive to become even more serious, even more committed to academic rigor and, and high intellectual values of how we pursue scholarship and debate and inquiry about history and science and uh, the, the key civic issues facing us and that there are elevated ways to do that at a university. And I was so pleased when, in response to those very conversations, the student body officers came back and said, uh, we have a proposed speaker for you, and it's uh, Professor Goodwin. And I thought, that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, she comes to us with uh, a, an illustrious background. Uh, she's been a prolific a scholar and writer both in the academic world and the public intellectual world. And uh, it's a real treat for us to have you here and to have you uh, symbolizing the kinds of uh, speakers that we want to have here at UVU and the level of debate and discussion we'd like to have about important issues around which many of us will have many different opinions, but we're anxious to hear uh, a, a variety of thought, but high level thought on these key issues. So a warm welcome to you uh, today. And again, thanks and kudos to our student body officers and to you students who have showed your seriousness today uh, by coming in the middle of the day uh, to an, a moment that's not required. This is what great universities do and are all about. So it's a great victory today for UVU. Thank you. I do want to let everyone know that's here that we are selling copies of uh, Dr. Goodwin's books right here, just outside the ballroom, and they're at 20% off uh, today only. And then for about 15 minutes, she's going to do some book signings, so immediately after her lecture uh, in just a minute. Dr. Uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin has been reporting on politics and baseball for over two decades. Goodwin is the author of several books and has written for leading national publications. She appears regularly on network television programs and was on -air, an on-air consultant for PBS documentaries on Linda B. Johnson, The Kennedy Family, Franklin Roosevelt, and Ken Burns' The History of Baseball. She was the first female journalist to enter the Red Sox locker room. Goodwin was born and raised on Long Island, New York. Uh, she received her BA from Colby College, where she graduated magna cum laude. She received her PhD in government from Harvard University, where she taught government, including a co one course on the American presidency. Following her tenure in Harvard, Goodwin served as an assistant to Lyndon Johnson in his last year in the White House. She later assisted Johnson in the preparation of his memoirs. In 1976, Goodwin authored Lyndon Johnson and the American Dream, which became a New York Times bestseller. She followed up in 1987 with the political bi biography, The Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys, which stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for five months. In 1990, it was made into a six-hour ABC miniseries. Her next book, No Ordinary Time, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, The American Home Front During World War II, was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in April 1995, as well as the Harold Washington Literary Award and the New England Best Bookseller Association Award, the Ambassador Book Award, and the Washington Monthly Book Award. It was a New York Times bestseller for six months. Goodwin's book, Wait Till Next Year, a memoir, published in 1997, is about growing up in the 1950s in love with the Brooklyn Dodgers. 
It has been a New York Times bestseller as well as a Book of the Month uh, club selection. Her most recent work, a, monument, a Monumental History of Abraham Lincoln entitled Team of Rivals, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln, published in October of 2005, joined the bestseller list on its first week in publication and soon reached number one in the New York Times bestseller list. Team of Rivals won the 2006 Lincoln Prize for an outstanding work about the present and or the Civil War, the inaugural New York Historical Society Book Prize, the Richard Nelson Curran Award, and the New York State Archives History Makers Award. When President Obama was asked if he could only bring one book to the White House other than the Bible, what would it be? His response was Team of Rivals. Steven Spielberg is currently developing a feature film about the book, set to star Liam Neeson as Lincoln and Sally Field as Mary. Goodwin is married to Richard Goodwin, who worked in the White House under both Kennedy and Johnson. Mr. Goodwin's experience as the investigator who uncovered the quiz show scandals of the 1950s was captured in the Academy Award-nominated movie Quiz Show, directed by Robert Redford. The Goodwins have three sons. It is with great honor that UVUSA and Utah Valley University welcome Dr. Cur Doris Kearns Goodwin. Thank you, and I'm so grateful that you chose me to be with you today to talk to you about some of the experiences that I've had over 40 years writing about presidents who are no longer alive, waking up with them every morning, thinking about them when I went to bed at night. And over time, this vocation of mine has become an avocation, and I realize how lucky I am. But it all began with Lyndon Johnson, for the experience of working with him really shaped everything else. I started with him as a 24-year-old White House intern. Now that used to be a badge of honor to say you were a 24 White House intern. It's gotten a little more complicated since Monica Lewinsky. But nonetheless, I was actually a White House fellow, a fabulous program where you go to work for a cabinet officer or, or in the White House for a year. We had a big dance in the White House the night we were selected. President Johnson did dance with me, not that peculiar. There were only three women out of the 16 White House fellows. But as he was twirling me around the floor, he whispered that he wanted me to be assigned directly to him in the White House. But it was not to be that simple. For in the months leading up to my selection as a White House fellow, while I was a graduate student at Harvard, I had written an article against LBJ, which came out in the New Republic, because I was part of the anti-Vietnam War movement. And the title of the article was How to Remove Lyndon Johnson from Power. And unfortunately, it came out two days after the dance in the White House. So I was certain that he would kick me out of the program. But instead, surprisingly, he said, oh, bring her down here for a year. And if I can't win her over, no one can. So I did eventually go to work for him in the White House and then accompanied him to his ranch to help him on his memoirs the last years of his life, never fully understanding why he had chosen me to spend so many hours with. I like to believe it was because I was a good listener, and he was a great storyteller, fabulous, colorful, anecdotal stories. There was a problem with these stories I later discovered, which is that half of them weren't true. <laughs> but they were great, nonetheless. So I think that part of his attraction for me was that I loved listening to his tall tales. But I also worried that part of his attraction was that I was then a young woman, and he had somewhat of a minor league Bill Clinton reputation. So I was constantly chattering to him about steady boyfriends, even when I had none at all. Everything was working perfectly until one day he said he wanted to discuss our relationship, which sounded very ominous, especially when he took me nearby to the lake, conveniently called Lake Lyndon Johnson. And there was wine and cheese and a red check tablecloth, all the romantic trappings. And he started out, Doris, more than any other woman I have ever known, and my heart sank. And then he said, you remind me of my mother. <laughs> it was pretty embarrassing, given what was going on in my mind. But I must say, the older I've gotten, the more I realize what an incredible privilege it was to have spent so many hours with this aging lion of a man, a victor in a thousand contests, three great civil rights laws, Medicare, aid to education, Head Start, public television, and yet roundly defeated in the end by the war in Vietnam, so sad and so vulnerable in those last years that he opened up to me in ways that he never would have had I known him at the height of his power, sharing his fears, his sorrows, and particularly his worries about how history would remember him. And I'd like to believe that that privilege fired within me the drive to understand the inner person behind the public figure, to look at my subjects empathetically, which I have tried to do ever since. So the book that really I'll talk about today, two of them, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt on the one hand and Abraham Lincoln on the other, uh, 
When I turned to Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt and the home front during World War II, it was in part because I was intrigued by that period of time, a time when our nation was mobilized by common goals, but also because I wanted to write about a woman, and in Eleanor Roosevelt and her true partnership with, with FDR, I knew I would have a great subject. It was an unparalleled partnership. Eleanor was the first First Lady to speak at a national convention, the first to testify before Congress, the first to host a radio show, the first to hold weekly press conferences, where she made a rule that only female reporters could cover her press conference. So all over the country, stuffy publishers had to hire their first female reporter in order to have someone at her press conferences. An entire generation of women journalists got their start because of Eleanor's press conferences. I found the setting for most of my story in the family quarters of the second floor of the White House, where Franklin and Eleanor lived with what almost was like an extended family during World War II. Indeed, the White House became the, almost like the most exclusive residential hotel you could possibly imagine. He wanted to have every night, Roosevelt did, when he relaxed a cocktail hour so that he could have people come and talk to him not discussing politics, not discussing the war, talking about books, movies they'd seen, anything that allowed him to relax. And that hour mattered so much to him, he decided he wanted the people who he wanted at the cocktail party to be living in the White House. So Harry Hopkins, for example, his foreign policy advisor, came for dinner one night, stayed over, never left until the war came to an end. Missy Lahand, Roosevelt's secretary, who had worked for him from the time she was 18, lived with the family in the White House. Lorena Hickok, a reporter who loved Eleanor, had a bedroom next to Eleanor's. Princess Martha, a beautiful princess from Norway in exile in America during the war, lived with the family on the weekends. And the great Winston Churchill came and spent weeks at a time in a bedroom diagonally across from Roosevelt's. So while I was writing the book, I became so intrigued with the thought of what fabulous conversations all of these people must have had in their bathrobes at night as they gathered in the corridor that surrounds the bedroom suites on that second floor, and wishing that when I'd been up there with Lyndon Johnson, I thought of asking, where was Franklin's bedroom? Where was Eleanor? Where was Harry Hopkins? Where was Churchill? But of course, I wasn't thinking in those terms when I was 23 years old. So I happened to mention this on a radio show in Washington, and it happened that Hillary Clinton was listening while they were in the White House. So she called me up at the radio station, invited me to sleep overnight in the White House. She said we could then wander the corridors together and figure out where everyone had slept 50 years earlier. So two weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 a.m., the president, Mrs. Clinton, my husband, and I, with my map in hand, went through every room up there and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins was, FDR slept where Bill Clinton was, and we were sleeping that night in Winston Churchill's bedroom, which meant there was no way I could sleep. I was certain he was sitting in the corner smoking his ever-present cigar. In fact, that bedroom is the scene of my favorite story in World War II. When Churchill came there right after Pearl Harbor, he and Roosevelt were set to sign a document that put the Allied nations against the Axis powers. But the Allied nations were calling themselves then the Associated Nations, and no one liked the word. So early that morning, Roosevelt awakened with a whole new idea of calling them the United Nations. It's where the word was born. He was so excited, he had himself wheeled into Churchill's bedroom, our bedroom, to tell him the news. But it so happened Churchill was just coming out of the bathtub and had absolutely nothing on. So Roosevelt said, I'm so sorry, I'll come back in a few moments. But Churchill, ever able to speak in a very formal voice, said, oh no, please stay. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. Can you imagine you are dripping from the tub, your stomach is sticking out, and you have the presence of mind to say that? So then Roosevelt tells him the idea of the United Nations. Churchill embraces it at once, even has a poem that he remembers from British literature where the words United Nations were once used. So that night, as soon as the President and Mrs. Clinton left, I couldn't wait to go in the bathtub, and then I truly felt I was in the presence of the greatness of the past. But I must say, I came away from six years of research with great respect for both Franklin and Eleanor. Too many biographers have felt compelled to take one side or another in portraying a difficult marriage, complicated by the fact that Eleanor discovered in 1918, after 12 years of marriage, that Franklin was involved with another woman named Lucy Mercer. When she came upon a packet of love letters from Lucy to her husband, the bottom dropped out of her world. She offered him a divorce, but it was the last thing he wanted, so he pledged never to see Lucy again, and they stayed together in marriage. 
but it transformed their relationship, for it meant that Eleanor was no longer tied to the home in the same way as before. She became involved with a series of activist women who were fighting to end child labor, establish minimum wage, maximum hours in work. She learned that she had a whole range of talent she never knew she had before for organizing, for articulating a cause. And then when he got polio and became paralyzed, she became his eyes and his ears, traveling first New York and then the entire country, bringing him back stories and anecdotes that he never could have gained on his own. And she became a voice for people who had no access to power, migrant workers, blacks, and women. When the war began, Roosevelt understood that when a democracy goes to war, a president must sustain the support of the people during the long days. It meant he had to be frank with the people about the difficulties of the war and yet bolster our morale. He managed this through a series of fireside chats on the radio that were timed at critical moments. I always thought he must have been on the radio every week as our current presidents are, only to discover he only delivered 30 fireside chats in his 12 years, knowing that they had to be special. And indeed, when his fireside chats were on the radio, 80 to 90% of the adult radio audience would be listening. He was once asked after one very effective speech, why not go on the radio every day? It's the only way to sustain morale. But he wrote back and he said, if my speeches ever become routine, they will lose their effectiveness. So at critical moments when battles went badly, he was on the air and people listened. And early on, he knew that he had to become a bipartisan leader in the midst of a war. So he brought two leading Republicans, Stimson and Knox, into his cabinet as secretaries of war and Navy. He surrounded himself with people who would question his assumptions, who would begin to argue with him so that he would have all different points of view. And he knew he had to make peace with the business community with whom he'd been at loggerheads during the New Deal. He had to mobilize the entrepreneurial spirit of business to build the ships, the planes, and the tanks that were needed to catch up to Germany's huge lead over us. So he brought in top business leaders to run the production agencies. He reduced regulations, relaxed antitrust, guaranteed profits, and the factories went to work 24 hours a day, producing a vast outpouring of supplies that are almost miraculous to think about. 300,000 planes, 100,000 tanks, 2 million trucks, 5,000 cargo ships. Indeed, before the war started, it took 365 days to make a single cargo ship. But cargo ships were necessary to transport our troops and supplies overseas, so they had to graft the techniques of mass production onto the cargo ship building. And by 1941, they got it down to 200 days. By 1942, to 100 days. By 1943, they could make a single cargo ship in a single day, showing what happens when that entrepreneurial spirit is married to the right kind of government support. He also understood when the war happened that he had to involve as many people as possible in the shared sacrifice so that the people on the home front would feel connected to the struggles of the soldiers abroad. So he created a civilian defense corps of air raid wardens, auxiliary fire and police, 12 million people. He sold war bonds in small denominations so people would feel they were supporting the war. He instituted aluminum and rubber scrap drives to alleviate shortages, rations, scarce commodities. And then, of course, through the combination of the draft and volunteers, more than 10 million women and men were serving in the armed forces, so everyone knew someone who was fighting overseas. Now, meanwhile, it was Eleanor who argued during the war that you could not fight for democracy abroad without strengthening it at home. It was she who argued that blacks needed to have equal access to all the jobs that were finally opening up once the war began building. With A. Philip Randolph, a great civil rights leader, she threatened a march on Washington unless Roosevelt would sign an executive order creating a Fair Employment Practice Commission that had sanctions and incentives to get companies to open their doors to African Americans. He finally agreed to sign, and as a result, two million blacks got jobs at all skill levels they had never had before. I interviewed one of these men, a wonderful man named William Barber, who became the first black motorman in the history of Philadelphia's mass transit system. He said he was so excited when he got to take the test, and he scored a 95 on the test, and the first day he went on the job, there were no trolleys running, no subways, no buses. 
All 10,000 white workers had gone on strike because he, the first African American, was joining their force that day. So for three days, no one could get to the war plants in Philadelphia. There was so little private transportation during the war. But Roosevelt had extraordinary powers when war production was being interrupted, which he used quite brilliantly at this moment. He sent an individual telegram to each one of the 10,000 striking workers saying, if you are not back to work on Monday, you are no longer an essential war employee. You will be drafted on Tuesday morning. <laughs> they came back to work on Monday, and William Barber became the first <clears throat> black employee in the history of the Philadelphia mass transit system. Eleanor also sent so many memos to General George Marshall about getting more blacks into the Army and the Navy that he had to assign a separate general just to deal with Eleanor Roosevelt's memos. But nonetheless, the Army became more integrated than it had ever been before. And it was also Eleanor who insisted that women should go to work in the factories, making the planes and the ships. At first, the owners protested. They said, it'll just complicate production. We don't have enough toilets. The men on the assembly line will be looking at the women. Productivity will go down. We have to teach new skills. It's an impossible situation. But by the middle of the war, with so many men in the armed forces, they had to open their doors to women. And by 1943, more than 50% of the jobs in the airplane factories and the shipyards were held by women. And the great thing, if you're a woman, was that productivity actually went up rather than down. So these same old stuffy factory owners decided we better do a study and figure out how had these women learned to operate these complicated machines so well and so quickly. I love the answer that came back on one of the study forums. They said it was very simple. When a woman, unlike a man, was asked to operate a new piece of machinery, she would ask directions. <laughs> I'm sure it was more complicated than that, but any of us who've driven endlessly with our men know exactly what that meant. And then Eleanor insisted that once the women were working in the factories, that the factories had to set up daycare centers. So daycare centers with a government business partnership were set up in all the factories across the country, operating 24 hours a day, providing not only daycare for the children, but providing hot meals for the women to take home at the end of the day so they wouldn't have to, co they wouldn't have to shop and cook when their day came to an end. So in the end, I think that partnership between Eleanor and Franklin has never been equaled. To be sure, they both made mistakes. Roosevelt's decision to incarcerate the Japanese Americans was one of the most serious violations in our civil liberties in our history. His failure to bring more Jewish refugees into America before Hitler closed the door forever will be a lasting scar. But in the end, it was his leadership that led America and the Allied forces to defeat Adolf Hitler and win the war that saved Western civilization. And with Eleanor's help and a robust economy and the GI Bill of Rights, the country that emerged at the end of the war was stronger than ever before, more just, more tolerant, providing more opportunities for more people than ever before, creating a giant middle class. But in the end, I suppose, my desire to bring ancient presidents to life took on the most special meaning when I turned toward Abraham Lincoln, the most extraordinary figure I have ever studied, a man both good and great, an unusual combination, a man haunted by death from his early life. Lincoln's mother died when he was only nine years old, his only sister in childbirth a few years later, and his first love, Anne Rutledge, at the age of 22. Moreover, as his mother lay dying, she did not hold out for him the promise that they would be reunited in the hereafter. She simply said to him, Abraham, I am going away from you now, and I shall never return. As a result, he became obsessed with the thought that when we die, our life on earth is simply swept away, dust to dust. As he grew older, however, he found comfort in the thought that if he could accomplish something worthy in his life, something that would stand the test of time, his image would live on in the memory of others. His honor, his reputation would outlive his earthly life. Well, that admiral ambition, so much deeper than simply for power or celebrity or office, became his lodestar. It carried him through the one significant depression that he suffered when he was in his early 30s, when his political career in the state legislature was on a downward slide. He was so sad then that friends worried he was suicidal. They took all knives, razors, and scissors from his room. And his closest friend, Joshua Speed, came to his side and said, Lincoln, you must rally or you will die. He said then, I would just as soon die, 
but I haven't yet accomplished anything to make any human being remember that I have lived. So fueled by that worthy ambition, he gradually recovered from his depression. He returned to the state legislature. He eventually won a seat in Congress. But then after twice losing a seat for the Senate, he surprised the nation with an upset victory to win the Republican nomination for the presidency over three far better known, far more experienced rivals. Everyone expected William Henry Seward to be the nominee, the most celebrated anti-slavery orator of the decade. And if not Seward, Salmon Chase, the, one of the founders of the Republican Party, Senator and Governor of Ohio, and if not Chase, Edward Bates, the elder statesman from Missouri. But as it turned out, though Lincoln had the least experience of them all, his unparalleled array of emotional skills proved far more important than his external resume. For one thing, he was determined from the start during the campaign not to disparage his rivals while they were busily attacking one another. Secondly, he worked harder than all of his rivals combined. Seward was so sure he was going to win that he went to Europe for nine months prior to the convention, waltzing with dining with kings and queens who were certain they were meeting the next president of the United States. Chase never went to speak at Cooper Union in New York, where Lincoln made his famous speech, and Edward Bates never wanted to leave Missouri. Meanwhile, Lincoln went from one state to the other, giving speeches that had an unusual power, and people began to notice him. But more importantly, perhaps, throughout his long career, he had never made permanent enemies. Even when he lost those elections, he had shaken off feelings of jealousy, squelched the desire for retaliation in the recognition that politics is a continuing game of human relations, that one's opponents today may be one's allies tomorrow. In contrast, each of his rivals had made permanent enemies who then showed up at the convention desiring to seek revenge. So when Seward just missed getting a majority of the delegates at that Republican convention, and they were scrambling around the delegates who were figuring out where do we go next, Lincoln was the only person who had not hurt their man. So he won the nomination, surprisingly, and then when the Democratic Party split in two, he won the general election. Well, the night of his election as president, he could not sleep. He made the decision that would define his presidency to put each of these chief rivals into his cabinet. A less confident man might have surrounded himself with personal supporters who would not have questioned his authority. He was asked, why are you doing this? You'll look like a figurehead. He said, it's very simple. The country is in peril. These are the strongest men in the country. I need them by my side. But perhaps my old friend Lyndon Johnson might have put it in less noble language. He often liked to say, Better to have your enemies inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in at you. <laughs> he was indeed a colorful speaker, as I said. Now, to be sure, Seward, Chase, and Bates were indeed all strong and able men, but in the end, it was the prairie lawyer from Illinois who proved to be the master of them all. Winning over Seward was the most remarkable achievement. Losing had seemed irrecoverable. When he accepted the post of Secretary of State, he thought, I'll be the Prime Minister. He'll be a figurehead. And in the early days, he treated Seward, he treated Lincoln, Seward did, with arrogance and maneuvering to gain control of the cabinet for himself. Lincoln saw what was happening, but he continued to treat him with respect, knowing how much he needed Seward's greater experience, recognizing Seward's hurt pride. And eventually, Seward came to love Lincoln more than anyone outside of his family. Salmon Chase proved a more complicated challenge, who became the Secretary of the Treasury. For unlike Lincoln and Seward, who loved to spend time talking to each other at night, discussing novels, literature, and plays which they loved, Salmon Chase had a more stiff personality, no sense of humor. He'd had a relentless drive to be president from the time he was 18. And in his case, the desire was more for the office and the power rather than for what it could do for the country. In some ways, that relentless ambition filled a terrible void in his private life. He had married three women, all of whom died young. His first wife, whom he had loved desperately, died in childbirth at 22, the next one of tuberculosis at 25, and the third one in her early 30s of tuberculosis. So all he had left was this desire to become president. And even when he was in Lincoln's cabinet, he was trying to manipulate people around him to make him the nominee in 1864. Again, Lincoln knew everything that he was doing, and his friends said, how can you keep him on when he's doing these things to you? He said, on a personal level, I would rather have him gone, but he's doing a great job as Secretary of the Treasury. 
and that's far more important than his personal feelings toward me and mine toward him. And besides, he's so awkward, Lincoln said, he'll screw up at some point along the way, which is exactly what happened. Now Bates, the third man, his arc was almost the opposite to Chase's. He was very ambitious early in the state legislature and the Congress, but then he fell so deeply in love with his wife, Julia, that he couldn't bear being away from her at nights, so he no longer stood for the Congress. He said he just couldn't stand to spend his nights away from Julia. Well, he must have found a few nights with Julia, for they ended up having 17 children. <laughs> he only agreed to run for the presidency in 1860 because he was from the South and people thought he could keep the South and North together. And he f did not win, of course. Lincoln won and had very little sense of Lincoln at the beginning. But in the end, as he watched Lincoln's skill in handling the complex human relations inside that fiery cabinet, he eventually concluded that Lincoln was as near a perfect man as anyone he had ever known. But the most remarkable transformation was in attitudes with Stanton, who becomes his Secretary of War. They had first met as lawyers in the 1850s. Stanton, nationally known lawyer, Lincoln known only in Illinois, Stanton came from Ohio and had a famous case that he was going to try in, uh, in Illinois. They thought they needed someone of counsel. Somebody came and interviewed Lincoln, thought he'd be good for the case. Lincoln was thrilled at the idea of working with this brilliant Stanton. But at the last minute, the case was shifted back to Cincinnati, Ohio. They didn't need Lincoln anymore, but they forgot to tell him. He kept working on his brief. He went to Cincinnati all on his own. He went right up to Stanton and Stanton's partner on the street corner and said, let's go up to the courthouse together in a gang. Stanton took one look at Lincoln, who had a big stain on his shirt. His hair was disheveled, trousers too short for his long legs. He turned to his partner and he said, we have to lose this long-armed ape. He will hurt our case. They turned their back on him. They never let him sit with them in the courthouse. When Lincoln left Cincinnati, he was so humiliated, he said he never wanted to go back to that city again. And yet, only six years later, when he was president, and his first Secretary of War resigned, he was told by all the men around him, there's only one man for that job, to wake up that sleepy War Department, and he is Edwin Stanton. He's brilliant, he's tough, but he's just what you need. And somehow Lincoln was able to put that past hurt behind him and give him that most powerful post. And they became extraordinary partners. And in the end, this unwieldy cabinet became perhaps the most remarkable cabinet in American history. For it soon became clear that Abraham Lincoln possessed an unparalleled array, as I said, of emotional strengths that proved more important to leading the country, not simply winning the election. He possessed an uncanny ability to empathize with and understand other people's points of view. He repaired injured feelings that might have escalated into permanent hostility. He shared credit with ease. He res assumed responsibility for the failures of his subordinates. He learned from his mistakes. He refused to be provoked by petty grievances to submit to jealousy. Time and again, he was the one who dispelled his colleagues' anxiety and sustained their spirits with his gift for storytelling and his life-affirming sense of humor. His gift for telling stories had been evident from his earliest days on the law circuit in Illinois. The, the judges and the lawyers used to travel together from one county courthouse to the other. And whenever it was known Lincoln was in town, people would gather from miles around to listen to him stand with his back to the fire in a tavern or a boarding house, telling one story after another for hours on end. And the stories were hilarious, not what you quite expect, from this marble monument that we so often see. One of his favorite stories, for example, had to do with the Revolutionary War hero, Ethan Allen. And as Lincoln told the story, Mr. Allen went to Britain right after the Revolutionary War, and the British were still upset about losing the revolutions. So they decided to embarrass Mr. Allen by putting a huge picture of General George Washington in the only outhouse where he would have to encounter him, and they figured he'd be upset about the indignity of George Washington plastered in an outhouse. But Ethan Allen went into the outhouse, came out not upset at all. And they said, didn't you see George Washington there? Oh, yes, he said. It was the perfectly appropriate place for him. What do you mean, they said. Well, he said, there's nothing to make an Englishman shit faster than the sight of General George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> and Lincoln had 
hundreds of these stories. <laughs> There's another time when somebody said to him, Lincoln, you're two-faced. And he said, if I had two faces, do you think I'd be wearing this face? <laughs> I was telling some of the faculty earlier, the first time I was on John Stewart after the Lincoln book came out, and I somehow made the mistake. He said, well, what about Lincoln's looks, you know, and that beard? And so I said to him, oh, if you'd only seen him before the beard, there's a picture of him. He looks so sexy. John Stewart said, Lincoln, sexy? Doris, are you truly an historian? And after that, I had to live down the idea that I had said Lincoln was sexy. But he was funny. That part is true. And throughout his presidency, he never lost sight of the people that he represented. In those days, the White House was so open. If you wanted a job, it was the days before civil service, line up outside his office and tell him why your family needed a job. He spent so much time with these people that his secretaries later said to him, Lincoln, you're wasting too much time on these ordinary people. He said, you're wrong. These are the people that I need to understand. And then he held these huge public receptions where he would shake everybody's hand and get a feeling for that person, which gave him a sense of the timing of when to do and make his different decisions because he understood the current of popular sentiment. He later said if he had issued the Emancipation Proclamation six months earlier, he would have lost the border states. If he'd waited any longer, he would have lost the morale boost that it provided. As it was, it was the perfect timing on January 1st, 1863. But there was one problem. The morning, he was supposed to sign the Emancipation Proclamation in the afternoon, but that morning he had shaken thousands of hands in a big New Year's reception. So when he went to sign the proclamation, his own hand was numb and shaking. He put the pen down. He said, if ever my soul were in an act, it is in this act. But if I sign with a shaking hand, posterity will say he hesitated. So he waited and waited until he could take up the pen and sign with a bold and clear hand. And finally, of course, he was able to express his unshakable convictions in a language of enduring beauty, almost as if the rhythms of the Bible and his beloved Shakespeare had worked their way into his very soul. Nowhere more beautifully than at that second inaugural. Here, the North was on the verge of winning this war after so many long years, but no triumphant message does he deliver. On the contrary, knowing that he wants to bring the South back into the Union, he says the sin of slavery was shared by both sides. Both sides, he said, read the same Bible. Both prayed to the same God. Neither's prayers were fully answered. And the words we all remember, with malice toward none and charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. Well, only six weeks later, his life would come to an end. When he was shot at the Ford's Theater at the back of the head by John Wilkes Booth, the doctor said that he should have died instantly, but he fought for life until 7.33 the following morning when, surrounded by his cabinet, Stanton, the Secretary of War, uttered the words that have come down over time. Now, Stanton said, he belongs to the ages. But even in Lincoln's wildest dreams, he could never have imagined how far his reputation would reach, how long his memory would last. There's an extraordinary interview with the great Russian writer Leo Tolstoy that was published in the newspapers in the turn of the 20th century, where he described having gone to a remote area of the Caucasus where there were a group of wild barbarians. And they were so excited to have Tolstoy in their midst, they asked him to tell stories of the great men of history. So he said, I told them all about Napoleon and Alexander the Great and Frederick the Great and Julius Caesar, and they loved it. But before I finished, the chief of the barbarians stood up and said, but wait. You haven't told us about that greatest ruler of them all. We want to hear about that man who spoke with the voice of thunder, who laughed like the sunrise, who came from that place called America that is so far from here that if a young man should travel there, he would be an old man when he arrived. Tell us of that man. Tell us of Abraham Lincoln. Tolstoy was stunned at Lincoln's name that had reached this far, but he told them everything he could about Lincoln. And then he asked, what made Lincoln so great after all? Not as great a general as Napoleon, perhaps not as great a statesman as Frederick the Great, but his greatness consisted in the integrity of his character and the moral fiber of his being. So that dream to be remembered which had powered Lincoln all his life had indeed been realized. The dream that had carried him through all his dismal childhood, his laborious efforts to educate himself, his string of political failures, and the darkest days of the war, his story would be told. Now, for most of us, the chance to have our story told will not be realized in a monument in Washington, but rather in the memories of our friends, our families, and our colleagues. Which brings me back at the end to where my love of history truly began as far back as the days when I was only six years old. 
and my father taught me that mysterious art of keeping score while listening to baseball games so that I could record for him the history of that afternoon's Brooklyn Dodger game while he was at work in New York. And then he would come home at night, and I now realize that I, in excruciating detail, recounted every single play of every inning of the game that had just taken place two hours earlier, but he made me feel I was telling him a fabulous story, and he kept my attention. It made me feel there's something magic about history to keep your father's attention. In fact, I'm convinced that I learned the narrative art from those nightly sessions with my father, because at first I'd be so excited I would blurt out, the Dodgers won or the Dodgers lost, which took much of the drama of this two-hour telling away. So I finally learned you had to tell a story from beginning to middle to end. Much later, read an essay by my heroine, Barbara Tuckman, who said, even if you're writing about a war, you have to imagine to yourself you do not know how that war ended, so you can carry your reader with you every step along the way from beginning to middle to end. So in some ways, I just learned that instinct as a kid, keeping my father's attention. He made it even more special for me when I was only six. He never told me all of this was in the sports pages of the newspapers the next day, so I thought without me, he wouldn't even know what happened to the Brooklyn Dodgers. Well, though my father died of a sudden heart attack when I was still in my 30, 20s, before I got married and had my three sons, I have passed his memory as well as his love of baseball onto my boys. Though when the Dodgers abandoned us for Los Angeles, I was so heartbroken I couldn't even follow baseball until I went to Harvard, went to Fenway Park, and then became an equally irrational Red Sox fan. For more than 30 years, we have had season tickets, and when I sit with my sons, I can sometimes close my eyes and imagine myself a young girl once more in the presence of my father, watching the players of my youth on the grassy fields below. Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, Pee Wee Reese, and Duke Snyder, I must say there is magic in these moments. When I open my eyes and I see my sons in the place where my father once sat, I feel an invisible loyalty and love, linking my sons to the grandfather whose face they never had a chance to see, but whose heart and soul they have come to know through all the stories I have told. Which is why in the end I will always be grateful for this curious love of history, <clears throat> allowing me to spend a lifetime looking back into the past allowing me to believe that the private people we have loved and lost in our families and the public figures we have respected in history, just as Abraham Lincoln wanted to believe, really can live on so long as we pledge to tell and to retell the stories of their lives. Thank you for letting me do that with you this very day. Thank you. Thank you.